Let us imagine that an experiment is in progress. Let us imagine that we are trying to obtain element 117 as an example. We have a rotating berkelium target and a beam of calcium 48. There is a separator here, and all of the divisions occur as described in previous parts of this lecture. We have the detector, and the detector currently reports what materials enter into it. Let us make a selection. We imagine what results we wish to obtain. We know the characteristics of our equipment, and we can predict what the energy of the first alpha particle entering the detector will be. Of course, it must be in correlation with this recoil nucleus, which stopped here. We can determine how much time this decay will take. Let us put these parameters into our recording equipment. We know that we are going to see something interesting. And when we do, the beam will be switched off. And we can see the subsequent decays with the beam turned off without any background noise. For all of these decays, we can determine their energy, their lifetime, and their position. That also applies to the fission fragments, their energy, their lifetime, and position. Please look at the position 2201 millimeters. 2209, 2220, 2216, and 2204, differences in one hundredth of a millimeter. It is quite clear that this is a perfectly correlated decay. It may be that, after the first alpha decay, nothing else will happen. Then the device will continue to work normally. The system is made in such a way that if during this time interval a recoil nucleus enters the detector and starts decaying, then the beam is automatically switched off. If this happens again, the beam stays off. This can be repeated many times. This system is very interesting because it makes it possible not to lose such events. And we can pause the operation of the system for between three to five days. Furthermore, we will not have any background noise. I will show you in a moment why we won't have background noise. Now, if operating without the system, then for the entire time of the experiment, which takes a very long time, a lot of signals similar to alpha particles are obtained. And if we switch the beam off, then radioactive polonium remains. And in the area of our interest, one, two, three, more than four orders of magnitude are eliminated. Here, we get about a speed of 10 to the power of minus 3 per second over the entire range, or 2 times 10 to the power of minus 6 per second per strip position. The same thing happens with the fragments. This is a graph showing us when the beam is turned on and there when it is switched off. There are fragments that can represent the background noise over a period of 80 hours. This is 80 hours and this is 80 hours. Then, in this area, where we are looking for fragments, the background is 7 times 10 to the power of minus 5 per second. And if we look at another position, 1.5 times 10 to the power of minus 7 per second, two fragment pieces a year, that's the background noise. Here is the 117th element, here is the 115th element, and the 113th here. Spontaneous fusion takes place here. So the probability of random sequences is 5 times 10 to the power of minus 10. The chances are minuscule. From all of the above and from the characteristics of the separator, 
We can conclude that if we have a calcium-48 beam with an intensity of 1.2 microamps per particle, we use a target of 0.35 milligrams per centimeter square, which is about 0.8 times 10 to the power of 18 atoms per centimeter squared. We collect a dose of the beam with an intensity of 5 times 10 to the power of 18 for 200 hours, which is about a week. Then the observation of one decay event equals 0.7 picobarns, that is, 0.7 times 10 to the power of minus 36 centimeters squared in cross-section. Here is the sensitivity that was obtained in 1985, and this is the new one obtained in Dubna. The difference is three orders of magnitude, a thousand times, compared to the previous results. And once the new level of sensitivity was obtained, only then did we see the formation of the 116th element. But we will talk about this in the next lecture. I would like to refer you to two review articles that I published with Utenkov, one in an American journal and another one in Nuclear Physics.